True Christianity, Book 1, Chapter 1, of the Image of God in Man, Ephesians Chapter 4, Verses 23 and 24. Be ye renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put ye on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and in true holiness, parenthesis, or holiness of truth, and parenthesis. Number 1. The image of God in man is the conformity of man's soul, of his spirit and mind, of his understanding and will, and of all his faculties and powers, whether spiritual or bodily, whether rational or sensitive, with the divine being, the infinite good, with all the divine attributes, virtues, and properties that can ever be imagined forth in a creature, with all the divine beauties, harmonies, and lovelinesses, and, in a word, with the original pattern of the divine mind, and the perfect standard of that, will from whence all righteousness and true holiness are derived. Now, it appears manifestly that man was at first created according to the image of God, and that this was after it had been first resolved upon, and in a solemn manner declared by the Eternal Father, in union with his eternal Son, Jesus, and Blessed Spirit, and with his divine attributes, virtues, powers, and properties, according as it is written, God said, that is, through the omnipotent word which was with him in the beginning, even the word that both was with God and was himself God, he outwardly and substantially expressed his mind in this effect, viz. Quote, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Unquote. Genesis 1.26 Whereupon it immediately follows. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him according to the resolution and degree which was just before mentioned by the divine historian. And this now was the creating word an overflowing power and life of the Godhead, which went forth as from the council of the Holy Trinity, if it be lawful, so to speak, into nature, whereby the image thereof became reflected in man and rested upon man. Number two. And hence, by the testimony of the Holy Ghost, it is evident that the deity of Trinity implanted its image in man in the beginning, and that this was after such a manner as the divine holiness, righteousness, and goodness might shine forth in his soul and send forth light abundantly in his intellect, will, and affections, yea, even in his very outward life also and that all his actions, both interior and exterior, might consequently breathe nothing but divine love, divine power, and divine purity. A man might live upon earth, no otherwise than the blessed angels do in heaven, always doing the will of the heaven, his heavenly Father. Number three. Thus man was made to lead a heavenly and angelistic life upon the earth, and by an influx of this godlike being and image in him, he had dominion also over all the things in this elementary world, being for that end but a little lower than the angels, and even that, but for a little while. Wherefore the creatures of the earth, sea and air, were universally put into subjection under him, that he might rule them to his Creator's glory, by divine virtue and power inherent in him, according to the express decree concerning him, whereby this was originally communicated together with that image, saying, quote, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and ev over every living thing that moveth upon the earth, unquote. So that all this is the consequence of man's being thus divinely formed and sealed with a divine image and similitude as a representative and vice-generate of God, whom he was to have expressed continually in love, power, and holiness. For God was delighted in to honor him, and this image he had made in man 
on purpose to take his delight in him, and rejoice, as it were, in his soul with the joy of a bridegroom in his bride, and of a father of a child born after his image. For even as a man becoming a father and behold himself or another self in his offspring cannot hence but rejoice with an inward joy hardly to be expressed, so in like manner God here becoming a father and beholding the expressed character of his person reflected in a living image of him or beholding himself in this his offspring, his rejoicing was thence in the habitable part of the earth, and his delights were with the sons of men as in whom he himself was represented. Thus God's chief pleasure was to be with man, in whom he rested as it were from all his labor. And our first parents and their prosperity were to have, have always enjoyed this blessed communion, had they continued but in his likeness, and rested in him and in his will, by placing their delight and pleasure in the original of this blessed image, which, as it was their beginning, was to be also their end. For though God rested in all his works, yet did he take singular and chief delight in man, because in him his divine image did most perfectly and transcendently appear, and did more eminently rest in him than in them all, as in the sovereign masterpiece of his creation, from which did shine forth the excellent glory in highest innocency, beauty, and luster. Number 4. For this cause God planted three principal faculties in the soul of man, which are the understanding, the will, and the memory, that in these three the manifestation of his glory might fully and distinctly be not set forth according to the variety of the divine numbers and powers. These faculties, as an outflowing from its original source and root, the Holy Trinity produces and preserves sanctifies and illuminates, most beautifully decks and adores with its divine graces, works, and gifts. Number 5. Now it is the property of every image whatsoever to represent a like form and figure of that which is thereby imagined. Nor can it be thought worthy the name of an image or solemnitude, unless it be like to that original that it is to represent. For an instance, whereof we may take a looking-glass, in which a man beholds his natural face, and views the reflected image of his own person according to the degree and goodness of the said glass. For in this an image cannot appear, unless it draw a likeness from the object which is set before it, or unless it conceives, as it were, the form of the original which begets it in its own resemblance or picture, by a due reflection of the light, where there is no impediment to obstruct the same. And consequently, as by how much purer and clearer the mirror is, so much more clearly and evidently does the image of the human face appear therein reflected. Even so, in like manner, the more clear and pure the soul is, so much the clearer and brighter does the divine image or the face of God in Christ therein show forth itself visibly. Number 6. And therefore to this end the great and holy God created man, altogether pure in the beginning, as an unspotted mirror of his brightness, without the least stain of blemish, being endured with such faculties, both of soul and body, as were then perfectly blameless and unreprovable, that so the divine image might in him be seen not as a vain and lifeless shadow appears in a glass, but as a true and living image of the invisible God, and as the likeness of his inward hidden immense beauty. Thus was man then, I say, created after the solemnitude of the divine being, in perfect beauty, there being an image of the wisdom of God in the understanding of man, an image of the goodness, meekness, and patience of God in the spirit of man, an image of divine love and mercy in the affections of man's heart, an image of God's righteousness and holiness, integrity and purity in the will of man, an image of his friendliness, his loveliness, his gentleness, his courtesy, and his veracity in all man's words and actions. 
by an image of an almighty power in the dominion and government of man over the earth and in the fear and subjection of all living creatures that was granted to him and last of all an image of God's eternity and the immortality of the soul. Number seven. From this image man ought to have studied and learned of the knowledge of God and of himself, and this should have been done by him before all things. Out of this he might have known God, his creator and former, to be all things, and beings of beings, and the chief and only being, from whom all created beings have their existence, and in whom and by whom all things that are subsist have their being. Out of this his image he might also have known God as the original of man's nature and fountain of his being to be all the essentially with where of the image and representation was shadowed forth in himself. So then we arrive hereby to the knowledge that God must be all those things after an essential and most perfect manner which are in the glass of the human soul as in a true and lively mirror of the Godhead represented for the manifestation of his hidden glory to man, and for the revelation in nature of the divine perfections before unmanifested, and that the image of these ought to shine out clearly in man to the honor and praise of God, who has graciously vouchsafed herein to demonstrate, according to the riches of his infinite power and wisdom, the most vivid traces of his unutterable goodness. Number 8. Therefore, seeing that man was carried in him the image of the divine goodness, it thence follows that God is the sovereign and universal goodness essentially, and consequently that he is essential love, essential life, and essential holiness. Wherefore, also to God alone, all worship, praise, honor, glory, magnificence, might, um, majesty, dominion, power, and virtue are to be ascribed as his due, because he is all these essentially. But not any of all these is due to any creature, or to be given to any thing besides, either in heaven or in earth, but to God only. And thence it is that when one came and said unto Christ, whom he took to be no more than a mere man, Good Master, what good things shall I do, that I may have eternal life? Christ said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. That is to say, good essentially. Know thou that but for God, and without God no good can be. And what meanest thou then thus to call me good, seeing none is strictly good but God alone? And this may suffice to have here hinted concerning the knowledge of God as the same is derived from his image in man. Number 9. Yet further it is to be noted that man, out of his image of the deity, should learn in the next place to know himself. He should know and reflect that there is a vast difference between him and God, that the distance between the creature and the creator must be beyond all conception great, and that in him there is no goodness at all. Even in his best estate, but a likeness only and resemblance of the goodness itself which can be no other than God. Man verily is not God, but God's image. And the image of God ought to be represented nothing but God. God represented indeed himself in man, yet was not man therefore created a God by that. Nor was he made hereby a deity in this world, but after the likeness of the eternal deity, that he might govern the same, not by his own, but by the power of God, as imagining and manifesting itself in his nature. In man, therefore, who is made the express limitude and portraiture of God, the very character and image of divine power, divine wisdom, and divine goodness, God alone should be seen, God alone should be glorified. Besides God, nothing should hence live in man. Besides God, I say, nothing should in man put forth itself. Nothing but God himself should be in him appear, operate, will, love, think, speak, act, and triumph. And if anything else besides God move and work in man, then man cannot be the image of God, but he is become the image of that, whatever it be, which now moves and works in him, and is the representative by whom it, he is acted and driven and carried away in such a strange manner. 
If man, therefore, would be and continue the image of God, there is a necessity for him to surrender of himself wholly to God after the most passive manner, and so quietly to suffer God to do and work in him all things, even as he wills. Whence, by denying his own proper will, man ought in all things without reserve to fulfill the divine will by a most true and perfect passive obediency, as one resigned, devoted, and absolutely given up to God, in whom only he wishes to live. This truly is a divine accomplishment as begotten of God, to the end that man may be a more most pure and holy instrument of his divine majesty and of his works and will whereby it now comes to pass that man does not move his own will, but has the divine will instead of his own, does not love himself but God, does not seek his own honor but God's, does not challenge either inward or outward good to himself, but refers all to the original good, and being contented to possess God is consequently without the love of the world. Thus should it indeed have been with man who ought to have freely rendered himself to the organ of the divine operations, and to have stripped himself for this of all self-propriety and self-activity, that so God might be all in him and do all in him by his Holy Spirit. To conclude then, nothing was to be, live, and work in man, but purely God alone and his word. Number 10. In hearing consisted man's perfect innocence, purity, and sanctity. For what greater innocence can there be than that man should not do his own proper will, but the will of his heavenly Father? Or what greater purity can there be than that man suffer God to, in him to work and finish all things according to his pleasure? Or what greater sanctity than for man to be as a well-tuned instrument of the Holy Ghost, the fountain of sanctification? Behold, here are innocency and simplicity and perfection. This is the highest innocency to be holy without self-will. This also is the highest simplicity to be simplified, as the little child in whom the world has not yet imagined or portrayed itself. Number 11. In such childlike innocency and simplicity, man ought to have stood in absolute obedience to God, and God should have ruled in him without a competitor, bringing, bringing all man's faculties and powers into subjection to his scepter of righteousness and peace, whereby a triumphant joy of the divine image would have also arisen in him, and God would have taken delight in him as in a beloved son. This, Thus the kingdom of God had been a man both without and within, and the tabernacle of God with the glory thereof would have ever been with man, had he but made such a total surrender of himself in all passiveness of spirit and true fidel resignation as the nature of his kingdom absolutely requires. Number 12. Of which kingdom of God and man, by an entire unlimited subjection to the sovereign will of his Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the most complete and absolute image of God, was in his human capacity a most pure, perfect example while he lived on earth, for as much as he sacrificed and consecrated his will to God his Father, in perfect obedience he saying, Lo, I come to do thy will, and in perfect humility and meekness saying, O oh, my Father, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And in consequence of this, his consecration by the obligation, uh, oblation of his will, freely despoiled himself of all honor and esteem, of all interest and self-love, of all pleasure and joy, permitting God alone to think, speak, and do everything in him by himself alone. In a word, he had always as man the will and pleasure of God for his own, which God himself testified by a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3.17 Number 13. This Jesus Christ, blessed forever, is the true image of God, in whom and out of whom nothing did appear and shine but God himself, and from whom nothing but good, God-like manifestations flowed forth, such as love, mercy, long-suffering, patience, meekness, gentleness, affection towards mankind, righteousness, holiness, consolation, life, and blessedness everlasting. For by him the invisible God was willing to be seen, manifested, and made known to men. And furthermore, he is, after a yet more sublime manner, the image of God, that is, according to his divinity, as being very God himself, or his essential image, and so, God of God, and no less than the brightness of his Father's glory, 
in the express image of his person in the infinite splendor of his uncreated light, of which I have nothing at this time to say, my design being here only to speak of him as he conversed and lived in his holy humanity when he dwelt upon the earth. Number 14. In such a holy innocence as this was the image of God also in Adam our father at the beginning, which he should in true meekness and obedience have kept, and carefully for that end he was to have watched over it so that he might not be tempted or surprised for the sake hereof to think of himself as if he were somebody or were to be to himself the chief good, but that hence he might reflect on himself as the image only of the chief good in the mirror of the Godhead, made purposely to receive the reflection of the divine form. But alas, he did not consider this as he ought, but chose rather to be this good to himself, that is, to be as God. He fell thereby into the greatest and most abominable of all evils, being deprived of this inestimable image, and so aligned from that communion of God, which, by virtue of it, he had before enjoyed. Number 15. By all which it may appear how man ought to have arrived by beholding himself as image to the knowledge of himself, and how he ought therefore to have considered himself as the image only, without ever attempting to set up himself for an original, or to be the author and the fountain of his own happiness in like manner as God is. But there is remaining besides another part of the knowledge of man's self through the divine image which is greatly, greatly to be desired. And this is that man was made capable by God of all the manifold benefits of this marvelous image, or that there was a capacity in the human soul to receive and reflect the divine goodness and take in all beautiful forms from the essential word of God, wherein they are all contained, and whence they are all manifest and propagated. Now the knowledge of this is no less important than the former, for as that is the ground of humility, so this is a faith. Wherefore, being rooted in humility by the sincere knowledge of our own utter disability to effect any good for ourselves by our having no more at best but an image of our of the one good, we ought also to be rooted in faith to the glory of God, even in the faith of his divine operation, to the end we may not miss of the good gifts which accompany the same. For it is no mean part of wisdom by faith to understand that man was made capable of all the benefits of this divine image, and together with it of sincere and unmixed delight, of solid and pure pleasure, of flowing and melting love, of godlike peace and tranquility, and of all the fruits of the Holy Ghost. And to know thence the revelation of the glory of God in man, even as it is in the angels of heaven. And this is a knowledge truly to be desired, which brings that peace which passes knowledge, being no less than the peace of God himself in the soul, as in his beloved image, and therewith spiritual fortitude, power, virtue, dominion, majesty, harmony, life, and light, which are not to be separated from his divine image. In consequence of this, it is plain that God alone should in man have been all things, and that man by virtue thereof would have been the tabernacle of God, so long as his heavenly image abided in him. Number 16. Now had self well been excluded, this could not have departed from him. And this abiding God cannot but live and work in the creature, for as much as he cannot deny his own image. That God therefore may fill man made by after his own image, it behooves man before all things to be emptied of himself, even as Christ Jesus emptied himself when he made himself for us of no reputation by taking upon him the form of a servant, and to humble himself as much as possible, and become obedient with him unto death. So indeed it should be with man, made in the likeness of his Creator, and the love and honor and praise of himself being thus excluded. Only God should his glory, his praise, his honor, and worship. For every like is capable of its like 
not if it's contrary, and therein rejoices and is glad. So man, being in the likeness of God, must therefore have been capable of God, to whom he was like, and being capable to receive God into him, he should not have received the creature or the image of the creation, but should have rested in God only, and in him continue to rejoice. And in this wise God had decreed to infuse him into man with all the treasures of his goodness, seeing that goodness is most of all communicative of itself. Number 17. Lastly, by the image of God, man ought to understand how he that he is, by means of it, united to God, and how that in this union man's true and everlasting union rests. And to know this also, that as one on one side the union of God with the soul is its chief tranquility and only true rest from which peace, joy, life, and happiness eternally flow on to the other side, the chief completeness and torment of the mind with all the exertions of this cannot happen otherwise than by the breach of this union or by ceasing to be of the image of God which in thy man's turning himself to the creature whereby he is deprived of the chief and eternal good from which for the sake of the creature he is turned away. End of chapter 1, having been read by Peter John Parises.